Well, today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Stephen Fowler. Uh, Dr. Fowler received his under undergraduate degree in math and physics from the University of Alabama. But having an interest in behavior at heart, he, uh, he continued his graduate studies in psychology at Princeton University, studying in the lab of Joseph Notterman, uh, who's probably best known for pioneering uh, methods of continuous force-based uh, me measurement of operant behavior. Uh, after graduate school, uh, Dr. Fowler moved to the University of Mississippi and established a behavioral pharmacology lab there. And today he's professor of pharmacology and toxicology at the University of Kansas and senior scientist in the Lifespan Institute and co-director of the biobehavioral measurement facilities. Um, Dr. Fowler's career has been one of consistent productivity. He's author on over 120 peer-reviewed publications. His lab is known nationally for its contributions to antipsychotic drug discovery. And um, he's, uh, he's received continuous NIH support for over 20 years. And if that didn't keep him busy enough, he's had numerous contracts with several pharmaceutical companies and private business. Um, above it all, Steve has never lost his interest in furthering basic research. He's contributed new instrumentation to the arsenal of behavioral scientists and earned a couple of patents along the way. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience, I met Steve when I was looking for, uh, for, for postdoctoral uh, positions, and I knew within just a few minutes that I wanted to work with him. And it was, it was partly because of uh, the quantitative rigor with which he approached behavioral pharmacology, and it was partly because of the, his measurement systems, which uh, I think challenge our traditional notions of response strength and what should be the fundamental units of behavior. And partly it was just the, the man himself, because he seem to so effortlessly intertwine behavior analysis with physics, mathematics, computer science, pharmacology, and uh, no one can show you that better than Steve himself. So with, uh, with your help, please welcome Dr. Steve Fowler. Well, John, thanks very much for that introduction. Well, we don't have much time here. I wasn't sure uh, how the um, pacing would go and uh, how much time I actually had. Uh, well, you see my title, uh, Dynamics of Response, that's borrowed from uh, Joe Notterman. Um, uninterrupted measurement of the behavioral stream, this is kind of bo borrowed from me. It's something I've always been interested in from my first uh, experimental psychology class training a rat. Uh, it seemed to me, having my physical sciences background, that just so much was being missed, and I've been spending my experimental time trying to measure those things that have been missed uh, in operant conditioning settings. Uh, uh, within the operant response is one place you can talk about the behavior stream, what happens while the animal is pressing the lever. Uh, it's, uh, any event is uh, registered by the application of forces across time. And you can try to think of a counterexample. And if you come up with one, let me know. Uh, so uh, there is behavior occurring during responses that are generally thought of as just events. So the event has a duration, it has an intensity, a force, and it has a, a time integral, which can be useful in some kinds of effort measurements, uh, energy expendi expenditure measurements. Um, there's within the reinforcing event, uh, what's happening when the reinforcing event is uh, consumed, and anything uh, that has a zero duration cannot be consumed. Uh, so there's behavior during the consumption of a reward, and there's real information in that um, about behavior. Uh, today I'm going to emphasize what's happening during the DRL under two circumstances, I mean under um, the IRT under two circumstances. Uh, one is uh, what's happening uh, when the animal's not lever, lever pressing in DRL 72 seconds. And uh, the other is what's happening in a cocaine self-administration procedure when the animal is not pressing the lever to receive cocaine. And uh, so we want to know uh, what's, what's happening to behavior. That, uh, you know, a lot of the tradition in uh, operant psychology is to, to leave all that out, saying it's unnecessary that because you can, with the rate of response, measure what's relevant about behavior by measuring the rate of the repetition of making these responses that don't have dimensions. Um, well, with my uh, physical science background, it just struck me that you can't do that. Uh, that is, good science says, uh, let's measure what the phenomena are, and so I've endeavored to do that. Uh, uh, here's, here's an illustration of what's happening within the operant. Uh, so there's an uh, application of force against something that measures force, like a force transducer. 
Uh, that force rises to a peak and falls as the animal moves its paw away from the operandum. Uh, when you define responses in this quantitative way, you have to have a threshold that says when a response has occurred, and you can also define a separate uh, level of force in terms of the peak force, uh, which we call the criterion force. In other words, the criterion force is where uh, program consequences are brought into play. The uh, uh, sub-criterion responses uh, don't have consequences, but they do have existence. And sometimes they're important for understanding what the animal's performance is. So that's within the operant. Uh, and this is an apparatus that I've used for well, maybe about 50 publications to look at drug effects on force and uh, duration and time integral of force, as well as other measures. Uh, the animal presses this transducer. It's located outside the cage, so we get uniform response topography so that we know what the response is in the sense that it's not just the closure of a switch that can be closed in any manner. We know where the transducer is, where the rat is, and what part of his body he's using. If he didn't do that, he could use his, his uh, mouth, his jaw pressure, for example, if you didn't fashion the transducer properly. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's an important part. Here's an animal responding. Uh, there's one person in the audience who has seen this before, and uh, we'll see if that person remembers it. <laughs> uh, so the animal reaches through this opening, and we uh, get uh, much more uniform measurements of, of response force as he, he reaches through the opening. Uh, and, of course, that's purposeful. Uh, this is something that I introduced in Notterman's lab because I, I felt like what we were getting was too variable. And uh, without controlling that. Um, the animal can uh, independently vary his forces and durations with basically identical topographies, and we've studied that with some high-speed uh, photography methods, uh, but I won't dwell on that. Uh, uh, within the reinforcing event, uh, uh, we measure that by having the rat uh, lick water from a force transducer, and it produces data such as these, uh, you get the rhythmicity of licking, but you also get force variation, and that force variation can be important. Uh, it also is responsive to drug effects. So is the rhythm. Uh, so, for example, uh, the drug clozapine, atypical antipsychotic, uh, nice, uh, there's produce a nice dose-related slowing of the lick rhythm without too much affecting force, but it also diminishes force. Uh, the drug olanzapine, which is closely related but much more a D2 blocker, uh, has the same effect, and it produces parallel dose-effect curves. Uh, the nice thing about this methodology, if just taken by itself, is that it takes almost no training and you get uh, uh, very nice quantitative data that's responsive to drugs and probably toxins too. So if you need a, a th high throughput method, this is a good method and it gives you a lot more information about the motor capacities. And we studied this in the context of, say, Parkinson's models, uh, mouse and rat Parkinson models, and you can detect some of the effects of uh, low dopamine functioning using this method. Uh, and then what I'm going to talk most about today is combining the methods. Uh, so this is a force plate actometer. This is something I developed about the time uh, Troy joined the laboratory, Troy Zarconi, is right there, <laughs> uh, to measure the behavior of an animal uh, kind of regardless of uh, training. Uh, it's basically an actometer, but it uses force transducers to track what the animal is doing. So the animal stands on a what's called the load plate and uh, at each corner is a force transducer and if we know the position of the transducers we can set up a coordinate system. So that would be transducer one, two, three, and four, quadrants one, two, three, and four. And uh, we know the distance of the transducers from each other and they're kept constant by this stainless steel plate. Uh, and by knowing the location of the transducers and the force you can calculate at any moment, uh, and we do it at 100 samples per second, uh, the, the location of the animal. Uh, in addition to that, we get the FZ force, which is the vertical force. So as the animal moves around and walks and turns his head and uh, grooms, what have you, it produces distinctive signals. And one of our challenges has been, uh, how do we uh, develop the quantitative techniques? Uh, what, what are the appropriate ones to extract the behaviorally relevant information from these waveforms? Uh, so uh, the data I'll talk about today, for the most part, uh, are in a context where we have both the force plate actometer and the usual accoutrements of an operant chamber, namely a, a reinforcement port, uh, an operandum, 
uh, and signaling uh, stimuli. Uh, and so I call this the hybrid chamber. So we take these three uh, beha oops, behavior stream measuring um, attempts and uh, put them all together. And uh, now we have truly continuous behavioral measurement. So as long as the animal's in the, ch in the chamber, we can measure something about its behavior. So if, if a drug stops the operant responding, we can interrogate the force plate and say, well, what's going on? And for some drugs, like CNS stimulants, a lot is going on. Uh, for other drugs, like D2 blockers, not much is going on, uh, unless you get high doses and produce tremor. Uh, okay. uh, this is just a kind of uh, warm-up for uh, one of the main things I want to talk about, namely what happens uh, to the behavior, the collateral behavior during DRL responding. Uh, this is uh, the behavior stream embodied um, a in a graph. So we get the XY coordinates of the center of force. Uh, this line here, uh, this tracing, it's over 200 seconds. Uh, this is the Y coordinate as a function of time. In other words, as the animal moves back and forth, we're tracking the Y component. Uh, the X component, He's tracking back and forth this way. You can see from this trajectory here that most of the movement is in the Y dimension. And so O means operant and W means uh, water port. And that's about where they're located in space. Uh, so you can see there's a lot more movement uh, reflected uh, in Y than in X in this particular setting. This is the distance traveled uh, uh, resolved uh, at fairly high resolution. And then this is the FZ force. Uh, the up and down uh, uh, recording of the forces exerted by the animal as it moves. Uh, this is the forelimb force from the op operandum. There are two responses here. Uh, this is the third, this is the fourth, and uh, this is the licking behavior and the force of it. Uh, this is a blow up of that, of the previous slide. So you get uh, more uh, visual resolution as to what's going on. And uh, so this is going to be the basis for the um, uh, data I'll talk about with respect to DRL. Uh, interestingly, when you get all this information together and you begin to analyze it and uh, considering what actually happens in the DRL, uh, you can identify various phases of behavior. And this is also related to some theorizing by uh, uh, Yin and Balin at UCLA and other people who are attempting to say, here are the functions of these uh, subsections of the basal ganglia. And uh, so people talk about uh, di direct approach phases to a reinforcer. They talk about the reinforcement phase, et cetera. So uh, I've drawn lines here and labeled them to uh, uh, indicate different phases. Um, so uh, you can think of the uh, DRL uh, as shaping a waiting phase. Uh, then there's some place where, uh, at some point in time, the animal uh, makes a response. Uh, there's an indirect approach phase in that it, it makes a response, goes to the operandum, and that's indirect. Uh, it makes the operant, and then it leaves there to, to uh, go to the reinforcement port, and then it's at the reinforcement port, and then the cycle continues. So uh, I hope that I have enough time remaining to uh, uh, talk about a future directions using this methodology. So uh, in order to uh, set up what I want to show in terms of empirical data for the DRL situation under the influence of amphetamine and under the, the setting of cocaine self-administration, the first thing to do is to say, uh, how do we, to show you how we uh, quantify these behaviors that are induced by drugs like amphetamine and cocaine. And, and by, by induced, I mean you give the rat the, uh, a, a drug and it faithfully gives you the behavior every time. Uh, its sensitivity changes, uh, but that's true for a whole variety of these indirect acting dopamine agonists like cocaine, amphetamine, nomofence, and uh, so on. <clears throat> so, and then I want to show that the force plate methods are applicable, applicable to cocaine. In other words, you get the same characteristics of behavior uh, with cocaine as you get with amphetamine. Uh, and then I want to show that if you put the animal in an operant setting, you basically get the same kinds of elicited behaviors. In other words, the, the operant behavior that the animals learn to perform uh, does not prevent the expression of the full-fledged syndrome that these drugs produce. Uh, but it, uh, the, there, there are some dose-related caveats to that. Uh, and then to talk about the DRL and the effect of uh, amphetamine on the behavior. But importantly also to answer this old question as to what, what is the animal doing uh, during DRL while it, quote, is timing. 
And uh, you know, there are a couple of ideas about that that are, are contrasted. And then to turn to the self-administration and uh, examine what happens in that interval between infusions. Uh, if, you th if you know either of these literature, uh, literatures, you know that uh, DRL is characterized by uh, long uh, inter-response intervals. Uh, in, in the case of 72 seconds, uh, at least 72 seconds, a lot of them are briefer than that, but a lot are longer than that too. Uh, in the case of cocaine self-administration, you also get these kind of paced responses. So if the unit dose is low, the interinfusion interval is short, and as the unit dose gets larger, the interinfusion interval gets larger. Uh, so he slows down as he gets the higher dose. Uh, and so I'm going to uh, address what happens uh, during that. So there are some similarities there, and it shows you get what looks like paste responding without having any pacing, uh, that it's pharmacological pacing, actually. So what are the uh, behaviors elicited by amphetamine? Um, well, at uh, these lower doses, you get activation of, of locomotion. Uh, it, these doses have to be taken with a grain of salt because of uh, sensitization phenomena. So uh, you'll get a different uh, look at sensitivity as the animal gets more and more experienced with a given dose. And so that's why there's ranges of doses here. But there's also ranges because uh, the, the behaviors are qualitatively different. Uh, so as you get out of this range and you get closer to the two to six range, you get what we call focused stereotopy. You get the complete cessation of locomotion. And I mean complete. I mean, I don't mean he just doesn't walk around much. I mean, he doesn't walk around at all. I just, it's like he's been given haloperidol. Uh, but his head is moving very rapidly. And in some cases, depending on the strain of the rat and depending on the dose, uh, there'll be some sideways behavior as well. But the back feet don't move. Uh, but uh, for sprague dolly rats, the front feet don't move either. Um, so at higher doses, and people generally aren't aware of this, uh, you get self-injury. The animal begins to chew on his forelimb and to the point of uh, breaking skin and, and bleeding and doing tissue damage. Um, and uh, a whole variety of drugs that are in this class, uh, the ones used to treat ADHD, uh, including sodium pemaline, uh, produce this behavior at the right doses. It does depend on the rat strain what dose this is evoked at. Uh, and of course you have sensitization. So uh, if you use a dose uh, in your experiments that's like 1.5 milligrams per kilogram to get locomotor activation and you give it five times, by the time the fifth dose is experienced, uh, there'll be some of the rats that will show focus stereotopy uh, so that your dependent variable, which is supposed to be measuring what the dose effect of the drug is, it's going up and then on the fifth dose, by the end, some of the animals is definitely going down. Uh, so that's a, a huge confound. Uh, and uh, has, I think, confused a lot of people in the literature about a lot of things for a long time. <laughs> uh, of course, you need to look at the rats to see what they're doing, but uh, there were you know, admonishments against doing so uh, back in the 50s. You didn't need to look at the rat. Well, I think uh, from a biological and just plain empirical perspective, yeah, you need to look at the rat. Uh, and if you're studying behavior, it seems like you should uh, look at the specimen that you're studying uh, in some manner. So here's a, an example of focused stereotopy. A clip, if we can get it to activate. Okay, no, notice the, the, this forelimb and that forelimb. So this is a 15 second segment. So uh, this looks like some kind of frantic behavior. Uh, but uh, this, this paw remains flexed, it does not go down uh, and touch the floor. The other paw stays in place. And uh, we know from our experiments in the last 10 years that uh, this is typical of uh, basically all male sprague dolly rats in this dose range. And we run them under very low lighting also to get this. Uh, you can disrupt it, but the animal will immediately go back into it. And I have an example of that in a second. So this is what we call a focus stereotype. We call it focused because the animal stays in one place and we want to imply he's not locomoting. And uh, stereotypy, because what he's doing with his head is, seems to be the same thing, but it's, it's difficult for the human eye to pick up the, the basic rhythm of this, or even to say whether or not it's, it's frankly rhythmic or it looks like a, a, a compound of several things that makes it sort of random looking. Uh, but we have a method for measuring that using the FZ force. Uh, here's an, uh, just a waveform from the FZ um, showing these rapid ups and downs of the reactive force as the animal's on the plate while he's moving his head. So how do we quantify that? Uh, well, 
we use uh, Fourier analysis on it. It's the, you know, it's the method of choice for uh, many kinds of waveforms to figure out what the frequency components are. And when I say frequency, I mean it in the sense of rhythm or rhythmicity, not in the sense of a frequency distribution in statistics. Uh, I don't know how many papers I've uh, published that during the review process uh, that was uh, not understood. Uh, so I've learned to say, say what, what the discriminators are. Um, so this is breaking, uh, uh, Fourier analysis breaks the time series into frequency components and it does them uh, relatively independently. So you get a power spectrum. I mean, some people uh, are old hats at this, but uh, many people haven't, uh, in, with behavioral training, haven't learned much about this. Uh, so we measure distance traveled. We measure spatial confinement, that is, is he locomoting or the degree to which he's moving from space to space, and we have a variety of ways to do this. And then we look at the, the spectral peak in the power spectrum to see if there's rhythmicity in it and what the uh, frequency of that rhythmis, rhythmicity is. And when we do that, we can combine those measures, and I'm not going to show a whole lot of data from combined except things you can read visually today, but we can uh, identify the focus stereotopy state. And another thing that we've done, uh, and this was at the uh, prompting of a uh, referee, uh, is to um, use four-hour sessions for amphetamine so that we could see the rise and fall in the, the doses effect. Uh, because on, after a single dose, of course, it's dynamic. What's happening pharmacologically is always, always dynamic. So you inject the drug. As soon as you inject it, it starts uh, being assimilated. It's distributed to the brain uh, and other organs. And, uh, of course, it's diluted, too. It takes time for the peak brain effect to occur. But as soon as you introduce this drug, you trigger the eliminative mechanisms. And so there'll be a peak, and then there'll be an elimination curve. So it's, it's always dynamic. And so what people do to try to avoid that is to look at the behavior over a very short interval when, it's not, when the level is not changing much. Uh, but uh, if you want to know uh, uh, what dose evokes what behavior in the same setting, this is one way to do it. You give this big bolus dose, and as the drug is eliminated, then you give the animal an opportunity to express itself at different brain levels of amphetamine. Uh, so that, that's actually been important for uh, these various studies, is the, the length of time you uh, look at the behavior. Uh, so uh, it kind of violates the notion of steady state behavior. It's not steady state because the drug elicits behavior that aren't steady state because the drug's not steady state. Um, okay. So here are some examples. Uh, here's one example of a four-hour session. Each of these uh, rows is a, a, um, a three-minute episode. This is the power spectrum of the FZ force, the up and down force as the animal moves around. Uh, the boxes are the movement trajectories uh, and each for each three minutes. Now this is uh, just uh, saline uh, treatment, so the, and this is the first experience in the chamber. So the animal does uh, what people know animals do, uh, and this, this is very, very uh, general. Uh, there's an exploratory phase, and then there's some habituation as exploratory phase drops out. Uh, under these circumstances, it seems reasonable to call this exploration and habituation, uh, but when you give a drug, you, even though you might get the same pattern, uh, you, you may be looking at other processes that aren't habituation or uh, exploration either one. So when you give an animal uh, amphetamine and he moves around, he'll move around in that chamber the 20th time he receives the drug, even after he's massively habituated. So he's not, he's not learning anything new about moving around in that chamber at that time. He's expressing this compulsive movement that the drug induces. So, so this is the first hour, the second hour, and you can see in the third hour there's much less behavior. And uh, you can also uh, see there's a dot right here uh, that's blown up. So you can see that that is most likely uh, a dot that size uh, and virtually nothing in the power spectrum means the animal's not doing anything. He's, we can't say that he's asleep because we don't have EEG or anything on him. but. Um, we, we have him uh, localized in space, and we know something quantitatively about what he's doing in that space. Okay. Now, here's the, here's the big phenomenon. Uh, this is uh, uh, amphetamine at 5 milligrams per kilogram. This is a fourth injection, a four-hour session. There's no operant uh, 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 accoutrements here. It's just uh, in the box. And uh, so, again, uh, three minutes, three minutes, and so on. So by uh, about 12 minutes, there's this robust focus stereotopy that occurs. There's a, uh, a rhythmicity to the peak, 
uh, that's at about 10 hertz, and, and each rat seems to have his characteristic frequency that is close to 10 hertz, maybe a little above, a little below. There seems to be an age-related dimension also, so it slows down with age. Uh, and then this is the movement trajectory. Um, so uh, the one reason it's spread over time here is that the animal is, uh, uh, I mean spread over space, is the animal is, uh, in this case, giving you quite a bit of lateral movement. Uh, at this point, the animal was taken out and given a saline injection. And you can see there was a little disruption because he wasn't on the plate for a while, so we don't analyze that. But you can see that he resumed the, the uh, focus stereotopy uh, basically immediately. You can also show, see that he's changed places, so one side of the chamber and then another side of the chamber. And then you can track that in three-minute epics. You can do it at, uh, you know, 15 seconds if you wanted to. Uh, and then you see that the locomotion is reestablished, and then you see hyper-locomotion hyper and then uh, settling down again. So this is the full course of uh, amphetamine in a non-deprived rat after 5 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, so this is the basic phenomenon. Uh, this is just a, a blow-up to show this movement trajectory uh, so that in the intermediate phase, when they've come out of the frank focus stereotopy, uh, that they move around in a stereotype fashion and probably, well, we know for sure that these, uh, these little clumps here represent a, an expression of the head movements, but they don't last very long. And then the animal rotates around the chamber. Uh, the animal tends to go in the same direction. It has a strong bias also that differs with different rats. Okay, okay so uh, basically we've shown that we have this basic phenomenon. Animals, given this dose of amphetamine, go through this phase of first focus stereotopy and then uh, a mixed phase where there's locomotion and locomotor stereotopy and so on. We've also, uh, with microdialysis, measured the brain levels of amphetamine um, in the striatum uh, after this size of, a, of injection at this dose. And uh, you get, this is a real data here, this uh, red line. Uh, these other lines are uh, uh, just sketched in to illustrate the idea that as the uh, elimination occurs, the dose level in the brain is going down. And it's not until about right here at 1.5 that you, you, what would be equivalent to 1.5 if that were the initial dose at its peak value, uh, you get uh, the uh, restoration of locomotion and uh, that's also about where you get the restoration of operant behavior. Uh, this slide is to just show with the same techniques. If you look at cocaine, uh, this is one rat on cocaine. Uh, you get the same pattern as you get with amphetamine, and uh, uh, it seems like that's needed for completeness uh, because if we're going to use this kind of marker during uh, self-administration, we need to establish that that's there too uh, for cocaine as well as for uh, amphetamine. You can see the, the rapid elimination of cocaine here compared to amphetamine. This is deamphetamine sulfate. Okay. Well, in the interest of time, I'll, I've said most of this, so I'm going to move on. Uh, all right, so uh, the next question is, do, uh, do these uh, behaviors emerge during an operant setting where the animal's trained to get a reinforcer? And uh, so we looked at uh, animals trained in our hybrid chamber where they uh, have a reward port and have an operandum, and they were trained to respond. And we looked at fixed ratio 20, uh, extinction in a multiple schedule across four hours. And here's uh, control data. Uh, again, the, the three-minute pieces, uh, here are the uh, operant responses. Uh, well, actually, the reinforcers are here, and then there's some dots you probably can't see. And uh, on the right side is the licking behavior that occurs uh, as the animal consumes the reward. And then the red represents the fixed ratio 20, and uh, then these three blacks represent the extinction. And so the animal uh, has learned the discrimination well. Uh, and uh, continues responding for a long period of time. Uh, and we did that on purpose, so we'd have a, a, a long, uh, multi-hour baseline. And water was the reinforcer. Um, uh, here's what happens when you give amphetamine. Uh, at time zero, the same kind of plot. Uh, uh, basically, the focus stereotopy, uh, after it comes on, completely abolishes operant behavior, and the animal remains uh, in a state of no locomotion. Uh, this guy was a pretty fast recovering animal, uh, but you can see that uh, even uh, as he regains some locomotion, he's still not lever pressing. And uh, then he begins to lever press 
uh, I think that's the first episode from my vantage point here. Uh, and uh, you can also see there's hyperactivity during the extinction period. And uh, you can see there's hyperactivity here, but it's patterned in a way that doesn't use the whole chamber. So the animal's kind of moving back and forth, forth as if there is some control of the contingency, but it's not sufficient to make him reach out and, and press the lever or engage in fixed ratio behavior. Uh, we don't know much about other schedules of reinforcement in this situation. Uh, we haven't done that yet. Uh, and it would be very interesting to know what, what does the animal do under fixed interval or variable interval uh, and whether uh, the uh, inhibition of responding, so to speak, is uh, particularly vulnerable here if it's fixed ratio behavior because the animal uh, has a, a kind of, quote, known effort requirement that he's got to complete. Uh, it might have some effect on that. And this, is, uh, as you see, is uh, some data collected with Jonathan Pinkston. Uh, this is also from the, the same experiment. This is just to show that uh, for eight rats, you get the same thing. So this complete inhibition of operant behavior is accompanied by uh, focused stereotypy, basically. And uh, so uh, that's uh, just to show the generality of it. Uh, and there, well, there's also an interesting phenomenon. The fixed ratio rate actually goes up as the animal recovers. And that's a significant uh, effect if you aggregate it. Not every rat showed it as equally as well. Uh, it's been difficult to demonstrate uh, increased fixed ratio rate after these stimulants. Uh, but in this case, uh, when the animal can choose the dose at which he begins to respond, you do see it. Okay. Okay, I think I've covered that too. Well, uh, let me jump on to uh, uh, jump forward to DRL engendered behavior. Uh, so we see what happens when you give amphetamine to a high rate behavior, what happens when you give it to a low rate, an animal on a low rate behavior. Uh, uh, many of you have, uh, know what I'm talking about, differential reinforcement of low rates where an animal uh, gets reinforced only if he with, withholds a operant response for some specified period of time, and that's usually held constant. Um, it's thought that the animals engage in both timing behavior and impulsive behavior when they're uh, being uh, controlled by this schedule of reinforcement. And then there's this long-standing uh, uh, controversy, or well, not controversy, but uh, difference in uh, hypotheses about what they're doing. Uh, uh, one is that maybe they're mediating the timing by some kind of ritualistic behavior, and there's some evidence in theorizing uh, to support that. Uh, of course, we also want to know how amphetamine affects that. And then um, uh, the other idea is that maybe they have to uh, somehow mediate this by uh, controlling their uh, impulse to respond and to stay away from the operandum. Um, okay. uh, this, this is all uh, standard procedure, basically, except they're me we're measuring their, their behavior in the force plate during the IRT. Uh, here's a, a saline uh, session, uh, same layout, uh, response, that's a response, that's a reward, this is licking. Uh, and uh, you can see the animal is you know, distributing his responses across time. And uh, here's a uh, cumulative record for the saline condition on 72 second at ERL. Uh, amphetamine uh, certainly interferes. Uh, the animal starts at about the same time he would have started if it was uh, uh, locomotor activity being uh, restored and uh, about the time for uh, most of the rats for uh, fixed ratio. Uh, this just shows uh, IRT distributions, and we looked at both 24 seconds and 72 seconds DRL, and it basically shows that you get what you expect. Uh, for the blue, uh, you get uh, a nice uh, differentiated IRT distribution for both uh, DRL 24 and 72, and when you give amphetamine, it degrades that performance, and that the degree of uh, peak shift uh, at 72 is much greater than it is at 24. Uh, so this just shows that we've, we're getting what everybody gets when they study this with uh, other kinds of methods. Uh, the lever inside the chamber, no force plate, and so on. Uh, so here's amphetamine under DRL. You get complete suppression. You get focus stereotypy uh, uh, and complete suppression of the operant. And then in about two hours, the focus stereotypy subsides. The animal begins to move and he begins to make some responses. Uh, he does poorly uh, at the the task as we move into the third hour, and then he gets better and better. Uh, but by the end, uh, he's, he's almost uh, uh, responding normally in terms of the IRTs. Um, so uh, when the animal is uh, uh, suppressed, 
uh, uh, he's not making operant responses. And the dose, equivalent dose about uh, 1.5 milligrams per kilogram is when he begins to uh, engage in the task, and it's not until well after that that he does well at the task. Uh, so what, what happens on the force plate? Well, first look here. This is normalized distance. This is the amount of, time, the amount of distance he moved uh, during those intervals that were reinforced or unreinforced. So the reinforced intervals are, have to be 72 seconds or longer. And so let's look at saline here. Uh, if uh, we look at the difference uh, between, well, just forget reinforced and unreinforced, but it applies to them too. So these bars show that there's a, uh, a large decrement in locomotor behavior during the, the DRL 72 relative to the 24. So the, the more stringent uh, timing task uh, suppresses locomotor behavior, and that's true for the long IRTs that are unreinforced as well as those that are. When you give amphetamine, you bring both, uh, there are eight grams per, per group here, you bring both animals up to about the same level, and this difference between reinforced and unreinforced uh, is not significant any longer. So uh, from this, we could say that uh, that extra training uh, uh, induces them to move less. Uh, so, uh, but this doesn't say what are they doing as the interval progresses. Uh, it just says take the interval as a whole, and it doesn't say where they are in the chamber, which is another dimension that you can get from this uh, approach. Uh, so this is the issue of what. What are they doing during the interval? And let's just look at the amphetamine versus saline. Um, so there's a temporal gradient of uh, less and less behavior until you get near the point where the animal uh, moves to the operandum. The fact that uh, this is a log scale note, and um, so he, he makes a big movement right before the operant, and that means he wasn't close to the operandum. But it doesn't say where he was or whether he was in the same place all the time. You give amphetamine, it just abolishes this gradient, even though he gets reinforced occasionally. Uh, so where is he in the chamber? He's sitting at the start of a, a IRT that's reinforced. He's sitting near the water port, and then he makes that decision to move, or whatever you want to call it, and uh, goes over to where the... Uh, operandum is located and makes a response. Uh, this, this is uh, one rat's whole session. Uh, so it's predominantly animal stays by the water port, but occasionally he stays even further away, uh, as you see right here. This is what you get with amphetamine. Uh, that control of behavior is broken down under amphetamine. Uh, in terms of uh, how the drug affects uh, where they are, uh, th note that this is where the water port is, so that's where most of the time is spent. Uh, Quadrant one is up here where the operandum is, and that's where very little time is spent. When you give amphetamine, you get a lot more time spent there. Um, so basically, uh, during DRL, the animal is shaped to stay in one place, stay away from the operandum, and to remain basically nearly motionless, but not completely motionless. And uh, we, we see from force plate records he's not asleep. Uh, uh, my interpretation of this, and it relates to some physiological data on the hippocampus, is that uh, it may be uh, a mistake to think that you can train a temporal discrimination like this independently of where the animal is. Uh, if you look at the uh, uh, hippocampal literature, there's a fair literature that says that hippocampal lesions interrupt DRL responding. But if you look carefully, that most people haven't done it uh, with uh, a separation of timing from Im impulsive behavior. Uh, and mostly it seemed to be uh, looking at burst responses. Nevertheless, uh, a hypothesis is that if you gave hippocampal lesions, you'd get very disrupted uh, behavior. You'd also get hyperactivity. And by the way, you do get hyperactivity when you give a hippocampal lesion. Uh, so it may be that you're interfering with this uh, ability to integrate time and space. And in fact, uh, if you think about time and space, uh, it comes to us from physics and from the Big Bang. It didn't exist before the Big Bang, so time and space are, are intimately involved in the evolution of what our brains can do. So it, it may be that timing can't be, especially in a rat, cannot be separated from space. Uh, I've got a little bit more time here. So um, uh, let's look at uh, what's happening during cocaine self-administration. Uh, this is done with Klaus Mieszczek in his lab, and I took a force plate up there, and we, we uh, uh, put it underneath his regular operant chamber, and so we had two basic questions. Uh, do they show, uh, do these rats under uh, self-administration show 
uh, the kind of manifestations that you'd get if you just gave them a, a non-contingent bolus dose. And then uh, are these behaviors related to the inf when the infusion occurs? Uh, and let me just say it's, it's a binge format that we c collected the data in, but we know that it applies to at least six-hour sessions because that's what they previously had, and we have six hours in the binge. Uh, the rest of it uh, is, is standard procedure, uh, and uh, we don't have time to show it. So this is a third hour of one animal on cocaine self-administration. Um, uh, you can see that there are instances where you get this focused stereotypy-looking effect, uh, and that's what it is. Uh, you also, it's mixed with some movement around the chamber in that square pattern. So the animal's in this, uh, in this zone where he's uh, going in and out of focus stereotypies, uh, be what I claim from this. So um, let's move along, though. Uh, this shows uh, the parameters that we, we measured. Uh, we have a focus stereotypy score across the, the whole binge. Uh, we have the time of infusions uh, subjected to a, a, a exponential first order decay with 13 minutes as the half-life of cocaine. And so if you accumulate the doses, this would be the predicted plasma level. And as far as I know, the only person who studied this uh, in terms of plasma level online is uh, Andrew Norman at Cincinnati. Uh, this is the rotations. You can see also for this guy, he didn't start responding. There was no priming. Did not res start responding until about 75 minutes and then he loaded up and con in conjunction with getting loaded up he shows a spike in the focus stereotypy he shows a cessation in the rotational behavior and then he lets this trough occur probably because he's trapped in focus stereotypy and then he resumes a fairly constant rate of rotations uh, and uh, these are event markers and so when it, this black line says that if we analyze the, the FZ force and look for uh, the peak being in the 10 hertz region, then this is the frequency of that. So it's very, very frequent. Uh, the animals uh, are engaging in this head movement rhythm thing uh, very uh, heavily. Uh, this is just a blow up to help, uh, help us see that. Um, uh, so you can, you can see this correspondence here with this. This leads to the possibility that you could do a cross correlation on this if you get uh, so you could start uh, correlating these different curves. By the way, these, the dots are represent the raw data. These curves are a low S smooth uh, to give you a better idea of what's going on. But there's a, there's a lot of variability, and I think it's because the animal's coming in and out of uh, uh, focus stereotypy. So he moves and then he stops moving, and he moves and stops moving. Um, let's skip this. Uh, so uh, I think it's important to ask whether or not a single infusion is having a behaviorally measurable effect uh, because if it does it t would tend to support the idea that the animal is experiencing a dose level that pushes him into focus stereotypy and the elimination rate is high enough that uh, he can then oscillate back out of it before the next uh, infusion so does a single infusion have an effect if you look at uh, uh, the uh, power spectra for this interval here before the infusion uh, the infusion occurs right here, and then wait 30 seconds uh, and look here as an after. Uh, you can fit this into most of the interinfusion intervals, although some are too fast for this. Uh, but when you do that and you calculate the uh, power spectra um, for all those intervals, so this gives the number of intervals for which these data were computed, uh, you can see that uh, after the infusion, the focus stereotypy is more intense when the predominant behavior is focus stereotypy. You can also see there's a tendency for the focus stereotypy to make itself manifest here. But this animal is much more of a mix between locomotion and uh, focus stereotypy head movements. Uh, so the answer to it is, uh, yes, we're probably able to affect the animal's behavior. Uh, it's probably a noticeable phenomenon, too, although I don't know anybody that studied that. That is, the animal can uh, discriminate that it has been uh, given another dose or gotten another dose. Okay. Uh, uh, one important point from this, aside from all theoretical interpretations, uh, is that uh, we have a, in this chamber an inactive lever, and uh, the number of lever presses on the inactive lever varied from 5 to 537. Uh, the amount of distance traveled varied from 710 meters to 1.126 kilometers. 
So the animal is moving a whole lot during this. He's moving and moving and moving. And uh, so the idea that the inactive lever is a control procedure for movement, which is what is said in the literature on self-administration, is just not correct. The animals are really, really active. And they're as, uh, basically as active as they would be if they got the cocaine from somewhere else as opposed to injecting themselves with it. So uh, that's, I think that's a, a crucial empirical demonstration that stands regardless of what your theoretical interpretation might be of what's happening during self-administration. Um, uh, a lot of the movement was uh, stereotyped in the sense that the animal turned the same way. It's interesting to note that uh, the animal that had the the, the most uh, bouts of, self, of, of inactive lever pressing, this 537, was the same animal that had uh, the uh, leftward uh, rotation direction. Uh, do, are there, do we have practitioners of uh, self-administration here? Uh, there are a few, maybe. Uh, almost everybody, according to the literature, places their lever on the left for act, active lever and on the right for the inactive lever. And it, I think that it, it may be, uh, that's why, and they have the, the jugular vein on the right side, right side, uh, as the site. And it may have an effect on which way the animal turns, and that may have an effect on whether he bumps into the lever or not, or whatever he's doing. Okay. So, uh, does bolus administered uh, cocaine produce the same effects as cocaine in self administration procedures? Well, certainly in this one it did, and the answer is clearly yes. Uh, and uh, is it likely that the behavior is uh, ch changing uh, as, from one kind of behavior to another during the, the interinfusion interval? And I think the, it's likely that the answer to that is yes, too. Um, so, uh, during self administration of cocaine, animals are very active. Uh, but sometimes they're not very active in the sense of locomotion in that they're, they're uh, in this phase of no locomotion but lots of head movements. And they're oscillating between this, and it depends on the, the rat. Now, since I'm not a, uh, I don't do this uh, research myself in terms of self-administration, I haven't seen very many rats. But I'm told that uh, by the time a rat has uh, had many, many self-administration sessions, whether it's a six-hour or a binge, uh, and this is from the Mieszczek lab, uh, that that's all the animals do during the interfusional in interval is uh, focus stereotopy. But uh, it obviously subsides enough for them to press the lever and get another shot of cocaine. Um, uh, let's see. Well, uh, one, one point I want to make about if you put all this stuff together plus other data that we have, uh, is that uh, if you look at the CNS stimulants and the doses that they're usually studied in behavior, they induce a syndrome, and the syndrome is a syndrome of various kinds of stereotypy arranged in a hierarchy. Uh, first, locomotion without uh, much path stereotypy, uh, without much spatial definition, and then uh, more spatial definition, and then finally sensation, cessation of uh, uh, movement and nothing but focus stereotypy. And then beyond that, uh, oral stereotypies that eventuate in uh, self-injury. Uh, so all these drugs do that. Uh, and so I would call that behavior compulsive because it's elicited and invariably you get it. And it seems to me it interferes with their, all the other behaviors. That is, you put the animal into an intoxicated state and uh, it's incapable of, of being uh, responsive to the kind of behavioral control procedures that you know, ordinarily use to get behavior to occur and maintain it. Um, uh, so I got one minute. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, what does this mean about uh, cocaine self-administration? Uh, given that there's all of this behavior and that the behavior uh, is followed by a reinforcer, it supposedly would strengthen that behavior. But it probably doesn't strengthen the behavior because it's already an asymptote. But you have to ask the question, is the animal pressing the lever at least partly controlled by these consequences of all this activity? Uh, uh, honestly, I don't think that's what's going on. <laughs> I think the animal's kind of trapped in his reflexes. And uh, I'm going to uh, have to uh, yield the floor now. Uh, but if you want to discuss that further, I have a, an idea about that, that that might be testable. And let me ask one more question. Uh, do, this is a, a knowledgeable audience. Do you know people who study 
self-administration in a two-lever, two-dose choice procedure. Does anybody ever do that? And then if they don't do that, why? If, if uh, a large infusion is more enforcing, reinforcing than a small infusion, why don't you demonstrate it with a two-lever choice procedure? Uh, so if you know anybody's done that, I'd like to know. And it works? Okay. I'll, I'll ask you for more detail on that. Uh, okay, well, thanks very much.